us that cheerful time. We'll pass offer and play. What you give will be for the conference, divided out among the men that came to preach the gospel to us. And uh, come on, brother. Um, if you're writing a check, you could make it payable to Freeway Baptist Church, and then we'll put it all together and divide it out among the men. Brother Billy, pray for us, please. Lord, it's been so good to get with these people uh, and hear them talk about your son, glorify your son, lift him up. And Lord, I do uh, pray that that's what we do here. Everything we say and do, we glorify your son and exalt him, Lord. I pray that we would see him uh, high and lifted up and we would, uh, Lord, learn more about him in these coming days. And I thank you for these men. I know you call them, and so I, I know that you'll equip them for everything that they, that they need to do, Lord. I just pray that you would continue to work with them. Thank you for them. We've been a blessing for so long. And I thank you for each of them. Lord, I just thank you for this church. Thank you for these people here. I'm praying for you to you guys. Let's go to Jesus' name. Amen. Sister Ashley is going to come and sing for us, and then after she finishes, Sister Linda is going to sing. And I don't know if Brother Jim is going to help her or not. Yeah, okay. They're going to sing together. All right, that'd be good. So I'm going to go ahead and sing, sit down, and get out of the way. And that way I won't have to get back up. <laughs> Man, if you don't believe the Lord's house is different, look at my wife banding herself back there. I'm over here with cold hands and sweat shirt on. Huh? That's folks, ain't it? <laughs> Our granddaughters were going to sing, but uh, they passed out on us. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to point you out. Yeah. Sorry. my 
mic on? Ma'am, is the mic on? Okay, sorry y'all. Okay, we're going to attempt to do this with a bunch of different things. <laughs> My Technology. And that. Yeah, so can you just um, work the... Kindergartners for too long. <laughs> because I went back there just now, and there wasn't little kids in the candy drawer of the pastor's door. <laughs> That's right, it was her. <laughs> Brother Jim, Sister Linda, sing, God bless you. Drew and Ashley, that was great. That's what a blessing.
teacher and preacher yes. his sweet wife this is one of the sweetest families I know right. the privilege to go and preach for him the end of October and the family, the people there in the church the saints, this wonderful fellowship Brother Gilbert Barr come preach the word to us y'all welcome my friend Gilbert Barr Amen, Amen. Oh, by the way, uh, for those that weren't here this morning to know, I know your schedule said Malcolm Ellis, but Malcolm woke up this morning with 105 fever. Pray for that brother. Thank you. Brother Gilbert. Amen. Thank you, Brother Pete. I'm short of those people. So I'm trying to straighten this mic out. I hope everyone can hear me. Can you hear me tonight? Yes, sir. And I hope and pray that the Lord will give me something tonight that will be a benefit to you, a prophet tonight. Yes. That's my main aim. If you all know about my credentials as a preacher, I've got the highest credentials of any man I know. I'm not wise. I'm not noble. And I don't have hardly any, anything that stands out to me. And uh, I try to see what you need to be a preacher. That's what it says about any child of God. There's not many wise that are chosen. Not many noble. Not many mighty. Well, that suits me perfect. <laughs> That's perfectly described me. I once met the worst man I ever saw in my life. It was sort of amazing because I figured it looked like somebody else. I was looking in the mirror. Mm -hmm. So now I've told you about all you need to know about me. And I'd like to tell you about something else tonight. I want to talk to you about the way God's people live. Mm -hmm. Now, when I tell you how God's people live, I will say this. That you might say, well, that's the way God's people ought to live. Or you might say, well, sounds real good. 
if I'm not living exactly like that, am I a real child of God? I didn't come here tonight to browbeat anyone. I came here tonight to impart something to help you live like God's people live. Amen. That's like Brother Peter was telling about a while ago about sanctification. Sanctification is something we have in Christ. But it's also something that you add to in your spiritual life. Right. You, yeah. you add That's things good. to your life. That's right. And your faith virtue, the virtue of knowledge. You know, you've, right. got, you've got admonitions from the Lord that tells you, add these things to your life. It's a working proposition in our lives. It's God. And when you do these things, the sanctification is on God's part in this manner. That when you do do these things, the Bible tells you, us, it is God working in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. So he's moving you to do those things. He's giving you the will to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. The desire. And so I'm going to, I've been preaching through the book of Romans, so I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12 tonight. I'm going to read verses 9 through 13. Romans chapter 12, but I'm going to deal a lot with just mainly verse 9, but I'm going to maybe bring the others in a little. But Romans 12, 9 through 13. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Definitely. Heavenly Father, you said if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And Lord, I do that right now. I'm asking of you to give me wisdom. I'm also asking you, Lord, to give the, each person in his seat tonight wisdom. Lord, to, to gather something from your word that would benefit them to live a more godly life and be more honoring to be. Mm -hmm. Lord, our purpose is to show forth your glory here on earth. We display a Lord your will and your ways to a world Lord, that knows nothing about you. Lord, enable us to do that. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Okay, verse 9. Paul says this. He says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And I think he starts off here with sort of a bang, doesn't he? I mean, he's telling you right off exactly what we're to do. Let love be without dissimulation. And all these things, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. You notice that the first thing in the, he, uh, he talks about is love. Well, I don't think he's wrong here. I think it's the right order. Paul summed up in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. He summed up everything he said in the whole chapter, verse Corinthians 13. When he says this, and now about it, faith, hope, and charity. These three, and there's not a one of you in here that probably don't remember the rest of that verse. But the greatest of these is love and charity. Is it really that important? Well, that's what he spent the whole chapter telling you. It's so important that if you were the greatest orator that ever lived and could speak like no man ever spoke, if you knew every mystery that was to be known, if you had all faith that you could remove mountains, and he names about everything you could imagine a man having with power and knowledge and the ability to communicate it. And he says, if you, have, if you have all these things, like no man ever possessed them, and you didn't have love, mm. you are noisy, just a noise-making, ranting idiot for the most part. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about it profits you nothing. Though you had all the rest, it cancels them out. It makes them worthless. Sound and brass and tinkling cymbal, 
just just saying those words sounds noisy to me. Clanking, jangling, noisy, but meaning nothing. Mm. Meaning nothing. Mm. And so I tell you these things because it's so important about what God says about love. Now I'm gonna do something you probably don't like, some of you don't like, but I'm gonna do it anyway. The NIV says translates this love must be sincere. And the word simulation is a word we're not familiar with, and that's the reason I'm doing it to you. The NASB says without hypocrisy. And so the reason I'm telling you that is because I want you to know that love must be that way. Well, that's what dissimulation means. It must be genuine. That's what it really means. It must be real. It must be real. Okay. And so we have to consider this. The reason is because everything about a believer, not just his love, but everything about every believer must be genuine. It must be real, without hypocrisy, and sincere. And I'm going to speak a lot about that tonight, about that aspect of what, of what ought to be a, a genuine Christian. Uh, well, if you talked about it earlier. You said about you know, what more? What you know? What is the difference between you and a, and a hypocrite if you only love those that love you? And this is what we're talking about here. You're not real. You're a hypocrite. Your love must be sincere. And to love even your enemies is right. proof that your love is not just for something you get out of somebody else. It's a genuine love for others. Mm -hmm. When you will get not only nothing out of them, you may even get contempt and be persecuted for even your love. And so what I want to say one thing about the way God's people live, first off the bat, <coughs> is God's people are real. God's people are real. And that's the reason sometimes they, you look at God's people and say, well, you know, God's people are peculiar. You know, they have all kind of different personalities. Uh, they come from every walk of life. There's men, there's women, there's bond, there's free. There's, there's, you know, people from different countries and different ways. And yet, these are things that can be said about every one of them. Right. These are the things that makes God's people different from the other people. It's not their personalities. It's not, it's not the, the way they talk. It's not that, you know, a southern or northern or whatever your dialect may be it has nothing to do with it. But we're talking about the things that makes them all alike. They are sincere and they are real. Yeah. Mm. Can't be fake, pretending, slothful, unfaithful, negligent. There's something about being a child of God that makes you caring. You don't if there's anything I abhor in myself, it's finding hypocrisy in myself. Yeah. Something I'm, that I would elevate in myself that I would not, that I would look down upon somebody else for the yeah, same thing. What a, what a horror this is when we think about how we must fight these things in our life. To be genuine, to be sincere, to be real. Instead, we're called upon these things to be loving, Kind, merciful, caring, faithful, honest, true, sincere in every way. We must be a lover both of God and a lover of God's people. I can say it tell you right now. I'll say this right off the bat. Are we perfect in all these things? Why not? Why not? We're not. But there's a sincere effort on yeah. our part to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. It is the will of God's people that he is sincere. He honestly pursues a righteous life. I've wrestled with this word righteous all my life. It always felt like if I call myself righteous, I'd be the biggest hypocrite that ever lived. I'm righteous. Well, it sounds almost hip hypocritical to say that. So I wanted to simplify it in a way that I could understand it. And I said, Lord, give me a little wisdom in this. What in the world is... What is righteous and how can I say in my heart and believe, I, believe I'm kind of honest with myself about being righteous in, a, in, a, in the way that I think it would be glorified to you? The word righteous has a root word. You know what it is? R-I-G-H-T, right. right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So righteousness is this. I want to do right. Yes. yes. Is that simple enough? Mm -hmm. We're talking about the simplicity of the gospel. 
Sometimes it makes things so much more complicated than yeah. what they are. Right. I want to live a righteous life it means simply this. I want to do what is right before God and my fellow man. Amen. Yeah. Before God and my fellow man. And like I say, we don't we're not perfect at this. But it should be the the thing that drives our life. A Christian is a person that desires to do right. Desires to do right. And he pursues it. And like I said, Philippians 2.12, Paul said this. He said, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, he says, As ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Of sanctification. That's, that's what we're doing. This is, what, this is exactly what sanctification is in our lives, is working out our salvation right. mm -hmm. with fear and trembling. And I'm focused on that part of this verse most of my life. But now I want to focus on the other part just for a second. Where Paul says this, and you heard it. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now, he says, much more in my absence. In other words, he ain't got to be looking over his shoulders to, for them to do this. We're not trying to please somebody else in this matter. I'm not going to come up here and try to act holy in front of, say, Brother Pete or somebody I admire in order to get their approval. Uh -oh. This is not what Paul is saying. He said, you are, you are dedicated to this more in my absence than even when I'm present. And so they were careful to do this when no one was around, no one was looking. And they weren't like all the Pharisees. Remember, the main thing about the Pharisees, they love to have these positions on the street corners right. where they're praying and everybody sees them. This is what a Christian is. He disdains this. He's not trying to impress people because it's something he does because he has a desire to please God. I want to live righteously. I want to follow the Lord. How important is this in your life? I want, we hunger and thirst after righteousness. I can't stand to think that I that, that would be a desire in my life to do something wrong that I know is wrong. Mm, Lord help us. Mm. And so this is a this wow. is what we live for. It's not anybody's forcing it upon us. There's something in a real Christian, a desire right. to do right. Right. I hunger for it. I want to do right. Yeah. And I ask God to help me do these things because I don't want to ever lose that desire. Because one of the greatest things about a Christian's life is his desire to please God. Yeah, yeah. His desire and determination to please the Lord. Yeah. Now Paul assures them in the next verse that when they do these things, and I told you this a while ago, for it is God, because when there's a desire in your heart to please God, and you're pursuing it, then you have this assurance, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. Yes. Because God will drive you to that desire. Amen. Now, isn't that a glorious thing to learn? I just hope and pray that this will make mean something to you. That whenever you're doing these things, you can look and say, God, thank you. Yes. Because I know you have put it in my heart. You've given me this, this desire to please you. The willingness to be sincere without hypocrisy is a divine work within a believer that separates him from the religious hypocrite. I think we can understand that now. He's real. He's true. He's genuine. He's not a part-time believer. Yeah. He's not a sometimes believer. He's not when, uh, when it feels when you feel like being a Christian. He is a real believer all the time. Yeah. We would say this. He's a real deal. He's the real deal. He's a, he is a real genuine believer. He loves what is right. And he's truly glad <coughs> to associate with God's people. Right. To be in the house of God. One of the things that I think is a way of God's people and true people is when God's children meet, he wants to be there. You know, yeah, I don't, I, I, it's hard for me to believe yeah. someone can be a genuine believer when you have to flatter him, when you have to pump him up, when you have to pamper him to come to the house of God. Yeah. 
One of the first cravings I had when God saved me, I wanted to be there when God's people met. Amen. Amen. I wanted to be a part of those people. Yeah. They were my people. Right. And That's I wanted right. to be there. Yes, sir. And so if real believers truly glad, truly faithful that you can be in the house of God without being prompted every time, without being flattered and pampered, Every time the church meets is an invitation for you to be there. You don't have to have a special invitation. Right. If we're meeting, you're there. What's more important than that? Mm -hmm. Than meeting with the house of God. Why weren't you there? Why can't you say like the psalmist, I was glad yes. that you said unto me, yes. let us go into the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. A true Christian without hypocrisy has a desire to be with the saints of yes. God. And that's a wonderful thing. God puts this gladness in our hearts. I want to be with God's people. They're the people I enjoy more than anyone else. Yes. I love being around them. I love to hear them talk. I love to hear about their lives and the way God works in them. And it's a blessed thing. See, God puts it in us to share our lives with each other. What would life be without if you didn't have to share it with us? I told these boys about hunting and fishing a little bit before this, the uh, meeting. And, and every fishing trip that I was on that I enjoyed, I had somebody else with me. I don't know if I'd want to fish by myself or hunt just by myself. There's something about sharing the adventure. Right, right. right. And it's like that with God's people. We share this adventure. Yeah. Amen. We share with each other. We love to tell the story. We love to share what we know with others. <coughs> it's the glory of that that puts joy in our hearts to be together. Yeah. God puts his gladness in his people to be sincere and real. And like I say, they're not perfect, but they desire to be. They're not hypocrites. They're genuine. Then Paul says another thing. Abhor that which is evil. I don't think you can have any trouble with these, with these words here. I think you can understand them perfectly. If I say, I abhor ice cream, and you that know me, you'd say, he's telling the biggest bald faced lie he's ever told in the <laughs> You know that name? You know that ain't what it means. Now, if I said something like celery, you'd believe me. <laughs> Though you may not know for sure, you'd say he's pretty well right on that. But we understand what these two words mean. Well, I mean what these words mean. The things you like, the things you really crave, you understand what that means. And when you say I abhor something, it means actually even, even a little worse than hate sometimes. I believe I, I believe if I want to emphasize I didn't like something, and I want to really emphasize I wouldn't just say I, I hate Celery. Is very celery. I don't really hate celery if it's cooked, but I mean, I don't like it raw. But if I said, I hate celery, it sounds bad, but I said, I abhor celery. You say, he hates it worse than I thought. It's a little bit more. And that's the word that's used here. Abhor that which is evil. <laughs> it's, I can't stand it. This ought to be cultivated in our lives. Learn to hate evil. Right. Learn to see yeah, the consequences right. of it. Love to see the evil of it so you can hate it the way you should. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Because it's a horrible thing to think all oh, evil is against God. David said against thee and thee only have I sinned. Irregardless if you've done something wrong to someone, you offended God yeah. when you do evil. Every evil is against God. It's sin. It's unrighteousness. It's that which sent the Lord to die for our oh, sins. Yes. Oh. Abhor it. Cleave to that which is good. Yes. Cleave. Hold on to it. Yes. Don't let it go. Don't never let good go. Cleave to that which is good. And so you have two amazing words to describe what is good and how you should love and cling to it and be drawn to it. On the other hand, that which is evil is what is repulsed, what is ugly, nasty, that which you despise with all your heart. 
words mean something. Yes, and listen, it must be that God's people, we must learn to hate evil. That comes a time in a lot of believers' lives because evil abounds so much in the world we live in that we become callous to it. We don't, we don't, we don't bother us after a while. It can be something happening right alongside us that we won't hardly take notice. We won't realize how evil is. God's name blasphemed. People only, openly and flaunting their sinful ways without shame. Filth everywhere. Mockery of anyone's religion. Hatred. Violence. Contentious people. People lying. Stealing. Have you seen these, these news clips of these people running out of these stores in California grabbing everything they can grab off the shelves and nobody can stop them? They just run right out the store grabbing as much as they can. And if it's not over $900, they don't even pursue them. You ever heard of such a You are allowed. It's almost legal to steal there. Well, it ain't. It's not illegal because they're not stopping anybody. So they must be promoting it. No respect. No. Right. Saw a clip just yesterday, I believe, of a man walking down the sidewalk, and there's another, there's an elderly man there. When he passes by, he reaches out and punches him in the jaw and keeps on walking. Huh. No respect, no love for others, no love for God or truth. Mm. Matthew 24, 12 says this, says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Yeah. And I feel like that's what's happening in our country right at this moment. Oh, yeah. There's a coldness of people toward each other. There's not a love. Mm. There's not a care. First mm. Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2 says this, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That means it speaks right to you. Expressly. Profoundly. Without, without any doubt to you. It speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. Demons. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Have our conscience seared with a hot iron. And when I read about this, it says, the latter times, that's what's going to happen. They will depart from faith. Are we in those days? We're in those days. Are we in those days right now? Well, I dare not say emphatically. But I'll give you another verse that shows it. It even speaks a little bit more on it in verses that you are familiar with. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I've read these verses so much I can come close to quote them sometime. Second Timothy chapter 3. This is still also, it says that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of who? Their own themselves. themselves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good. You read these things. What horrible things. Traitors, heady, heady high-minded. It says, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. <coughs> Have I not described the generation we're living in right now? Right. If we're not living in these times, I don't see how it could get much worse and showing exactly what we're reading here. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It says, from such turn away. For this sort of age which creep into, it says, into houses and lead captive silly women laid away with divers lusts. Ever learning. And this probably puts the ice on the table. These people are ever learning. Never. And never, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm. Are we in those days? Mm. We are to abhor what we hear and hear. These things are evil. There will be something that ought to really grip, <coughs> just grasp us. And it ought to turn our guts, turn our hearts to see how evil is abounding. And 
the love of everyone is waxing cold around us. Mm. And then Psalms 97 verse 10. You ever heard this verse before? I know you all have. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Ye that love the Lord. It's a command. Hate evil. You're commanded to do that. Proverbs 8.13 the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Colon. In case you need a little, a little help on what evil is, it says pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth. That's a perverse mouth. Forward means perverse. It means that which is wicked and out of the way. And the forward mouth do I hate. Then the Bible says, warn to them, Isaiah 5 20, that call good. evil good. good. You ever seen such a thing as our day? Do you see these people that are calling things like abortion good? And if you oppose it, they call you bad? Murdering babies that are unborn. No. They call homosexuality good people. And if you're opposing, you're the bad person. That's right. You're bad. It says that put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I believe this generation has perfected this wickedness mm. in a way like I've never seen it. Mm. A man that stands up to the things of God, a woman that wants to be subservient to her husband and respect him and love him as head of the house and to raise their children and nurture and admonition of God are deemed evil people yeah. that are ignorant and unlearned. What a wicked generation we live in. They perfected these things. They bitterly call that which is evil good. They praise filth, homosexuality, all these things. Evil talking, lying, lawlessness. They condemn even patriotism, morality, marriage, marriage, worshiping God. They make fun of purity. Right. They make fun of godly families where the husband is the head of the home. Even working and earning and living. They curse people that are doing well, doing good. They cause others to lose sight of what is really good and they promote only that which is evil. And it seems like they never quit. They work morning, noon, and night to pervert the truth. It is the duty of believers to hate evil and to separate themselves from those who practice evil. One of my favorite uh, verses in the Old Testament, passages in the Old Testament, is Psalms chapter 1. Mm. And it pretty well says the same thing. It separates himself from ungodly. We have to separate. That's what sanctification is, is separating ourselves, being set apart. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Right. But his delight. Notice that word delight again. Yeah. What he craves, what he wants, what he, what he wants to do. That which makes him happy. That which makes him joyful and feeling blessed. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate. 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 When? Day and night. Morning and night. Day and night. He thinks about what the things God has shown him in Scripture. He thinks about the Word of God. Yes, he meditates. He studies it. He ponders it. There's nothing more joyful to a believer than pondering the Word of God. And when God shows him something, he say, Wow! How did I not see that earlier? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. I kind of feel like that moment, Pete, when I have all these rivers around me. It says, 
that bringeth forth his, his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Amen. You see that promise of God? Next verse says, The ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff with which the wind driveth away. So different to look at the life of an ungodly man and the life, the purposeful life of a believer. Yes. His life has value and it means something. It achieves something. It's prosperous. Maybe not to the ungodly man, but what more prosperity can you have than pleasing God? Right. There you go, what brother. What a blessing. What a blessing. He ponders these things. I, I love this. I love the scriptures because of things they say here about these things. Let me read you some verses that you probably have thought about, may have heard, but you probably haven't heard a sermon on very, very often because people don't preach these things. Psalms chapter 5. Mm. Psalms chapter 5. I love Psalms chapter 5. I made my New Year's resolution the first three verses of Psalms chapter 5 one year because I wanted to, I wanted to pray early in the morning. I made it a New Year's resolution. I'm going to get up early and call upon the Lord every day. I want to do it every single day. Before I do anything else, I want to get up and I want to seek God's face and pray. <clears throat> Give ear to my words to the Lord. It starts off. And that's asking God Lord, please hear me. Give ear to my words. When I come to you and ask something of you, Lord, please hear me. Give ear to my words. That's a bold thing to say to God, isn't it? Hey, God, give, listen to me. That's what he's saying. But it's a prayer here. I mean, this, this, this is what the, the psalmist is praying to God for. Lord, listen to me. Here I am, Lord. Listen, hear me, Lord. Give ear to my words. I don't think God put that in the scripture just for this guy. I put myself right there. Mm. Lord, listen to, listen to you this morning. Listen to me, please. <clears throat> and then it becomes more humble that you're not asking something in pride and arrogance. Like, I'm so important. Look, it's not that way. No. Because he says, consider my meditation. Consider, O oh Lord. This is important to me. Hear me, Lord. And he says, hearken the voice of my cry, my king and my God, for unto thee will I pray. <clears throat> now we set the place where we should be. Hearken to me. Hearken to me in the voice of my cry, my king and my God. You're my ruler. You're my God. I'm under you as a... Mm. Who am I? Nothing. But I'm pleading to the mighty God mm. to hear my voice. Yeah. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning. Mm. That's my resolution. I want God to know that my voice will be calling on Him every morning. I will. And after the year of the resolution, I said, you don't go a one year resolution in this thing. We're adding to our faith something that's deep. And in our church every year we bring this up at before right at the new year. And everybody in our church looks at their life and examines their life and considers what would be a good resolution this year? What is something lacking in my life that I need to get right with God? What is there in my life that I can improve my faith <coughs> that I can improve the way I live for God. And we take a verse from the scripture and we apply it to our lives. And we have purpose that we will not get rid of these after one year. These are what we add and then add something else to the next year. It's not something we discard. It's something you purposefully do. My voice shall I hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Mm -hmm. that tomorrow will you do that? 
will you go before the Lord? My voice shall I hear. This is something I've purposed in my heart that I want to do. This is part of what it means to be a child of God. The way God's people live. We, we purpose to do things that will mean something in our lives as a believer. Right. You know, we make all kind of plans all the time for things we do in the natural world. I set up dates and put them on calendars of things that I'm going to do. Visit people. Maybe come to a conference like this. Or whatever. Make a trip. Go see one of our children. Make a plan in your life for God. That you will do something in your life in a more purposeful way. You will try a little hard. You'll do a little something extra here. We're, we have a living faith. Right. Yes. So it's, it keeps on growing. Yes, right. bro. It's something yes. we add to. It's something we want to grow in. And what a blessing. For thou art not a God, Nick verse 4 says, that has pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Evil does not dwell with God. Now I'm going to show you a verse right here of why we should hate evil. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou. Are you reading with me in verse 5, Psalms 5, 5? Thou, God, hatest all workers of iniquity. Hmm. Do I have to explain it? Can we not understand what God's saying? Is this not as plain as those in everyone's face that God has said he hates all workers of iniquity. Yes. I haven't heard many sermons lately on this subject. I don't think Joel Osteen could be tempted to preach it. Uh, I doubt. I doubt, seriously. Thou shalt destroy them that speak least in. The Lord will, here's that word again, abhor. Abhor. The bloody and deceitful man. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Hate evil. The Lord hates it. But it's for me. Yeah. I will come to thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness. Yes. Lead me there. I want to be in that direction. I sure don't want to go in that other direction. Lead me in thy righteousness because of my enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. And here's the prayer. When's the last time you prayed like this? I'm looking at it. I'm looking at what the psalmist says to God. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. And the next two verses may be my favorite two verses in the Old Testament. Two of my, two of my favorite. But... Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Yeah. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest yeah, them. Amen. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee for thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass in his will amen. as with a shield. I think about, I remember I used to watch these stupid shows a long time ago when I was, these, some of these space shows, they'd show these people had this force field around them. And if they had this force field around them, they would shoot a, a bazooka and it would just bounce off that force field. It was invisible, but you couldn't see it, but it wouldn't touch them. 
I think they must. How often people copy things that are right out of right. scripture? Right. Oh yeah. Sure. This is a forced film, folks. I mean, it's the best there is. That's right. How good is it? This is the best there is. That's nothing that compares. Let me give you a, a, a New Testament commentary on this. Romans 8.28 mm -hmm. All things work together for good. Yeah. For good, never bad. All things, everything yes. that love God yes. to them who are the called according to His purpose. What an amazing thing. This is the God we worship. This is the confidence we have in God that everything in our lives will work for our good no matter what other men may think. Right. We, don't walk, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. Right. It may not look good, but I'm telling you, it's the best thing that possibly happen to you. Amen. What happens to you is God's best. Be thankful and thank God for all He does. Be thankful for all things, Scripture says. Yes, sir. What an amazing thing. And then it says, cleave to that which is good. That word cleave comes from a word that is kaleo. I'm a Greek scholar, by the way. <laughs> that comes from the root Greek word kala. It's Greek to me. But I read what it means. It means glued, glued together. And so the Bible says, cleave to that which is good. Let it be something that you are glued to that will not be pulled apart. It's inseparable. Yes. Cleave to that which is good. It's something that we ought to have a desire to do. Since we're righteous people of God, we want to do right, then that's what it is. It's doing good. It's doing what's right. Cleaving to that which is good. Every believer must hold on. Hold to that which is true. Hold to that which is right. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 23 is another commentary on, I think, this passage. <coughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Chapter 5 and verses uh, 15 through 23. It says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but follow after that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And this is a, another time where rejoicing is commanded. Rejoice evermore. Evermore. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. You ever wonder what God's will was for you? I wish I knew how. I, knew, I wish I knew what the will of God is. Well, I don't know about all the things that God wants us to do, but I can tell you this. It says, in everything you have thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. I'd be right about that one. Sure shot. Put this into practice. This is the way God's people live. Yes, Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things. Hold fast. That's that glue. Hold fast. That which is good. Isn't that, isn't that something that you, right now you're thinking, I want to do that. I'm going to put a grip on that which is good. I'm going to hold fast to it. Make that a purpose of your life. Yes, sir. To desire to do good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Yeah. That's a mighty broad commandment. There are a lot of things in this world that Paul said, you know, well, awful, but not what he called expedient. 
It might have been lawful, but it sure wouldn't look good to do it. Or to have anything to do with it. Abstain from appearance of evil. Anything that would cause you to be misinterpreted, would cause you to be mistakenly identified in a certain way. Don't do it. Stay away from it. You know what I like about Joseph? When he was confronted with Potiphar's wife, he ran. Don't run from evil. Get away from it. Cleave to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I could read the whole chapter here, but let's hold off there. We get the idea that we're to abstain from that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. And then the, ver the rest of the verses, I'm not going to dwell very long on what's left there. In verses 9 through, <clears throat> in verses uh, 10 through 13, where it says, Be kindly affection, one to another, with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributed the necessity of the saints. Being kindly affection, one another, with brotherly love, it means preferring one and preferring uh, and in honor preferring one another. And once again, we could say all of these deserve a sermon in itself. We can't do that tonight. But I just want to bring them before you. Being devoted to one another is what this really means. Holding others a little bit higher than yourself. And I just want to say a little bit about this. It says uh, preferring one another. This is the way we treat other people. We do unto them as we say as we would have done to us. Let me give you an example. We teach our kids, don't we? From the time they're little, not to be selfish. Not to be always trying to get the biggest piece to, of something that's good that they like. To not be hogging, greedy, and, and do these things. But do we teach our children something and do the opposite ourselves? You know, you teach our children, don't, don't get the biggest piece. You know, this time, let the other child have it. How about ourselves? How about the best tree stand? Can talk about that, can't you? How about, I've got, we're going fishing. I've got two rod, and I've got two rod reels here. Brother Pete, come fishing with me. You take this, and it's the one I like the best. It's putting others above ourselves. This is something we all understand. But it pertains to many things in life. Put others above yourself. Don't always have that, that this is the one I want. Attitude. You understand? For what maketh thee to differ from another? Or what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Everything I got has been given to me by God. Yeah, right. Brother and David. we all think, well, this is mine. But from God's standpoint, it ain't yours. I came in here with nothing. I don't have anything. And God's about letting me take any of them with me when I leave. So it ain't mine. It's so long. He's let me borrow it for a while. So always think about this. What you have is not really yours anyway. It's just something God's letting you enjoy while you're here. You're not going to be able to keep it. So don't glory as if it belongs to you and you have, you know, you can do whatever you want with it as, in any way you want. There's nothing that we have not received from God. So be kind, merciful, and gentle to others. God gave you a lot. There's something glorious about giving to others. Yeah. I love to give to other people. There's nothing in any man that he did not receive. Whatever he is or has or is even able to do was all given to him. <clears throat> if God withheld anything from you, you would not be what you are. You understand that? If God had not given you what you are, you would not be the same person you are. 
And the reason I tell you this, to look at the person, or imagine, in your mind right now, imagine the person that you are most repulsed by. <clears throat> and I can tell you, except God had made you the way you were, you might be exactly as that detestable person that you imagine yourself better than. We all think more of, a high, of ourselves, more highly of ourselves many times than we ought to. That's a terrible thing. We're taught in Titus 3, 2 through 4, to speak evil of no man, it says there. <clears throat> I'm not going to turn there. I remember when Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. I remember these words of some of things that come to our mind. And you say, how could he do that? They were spitting in his face. They plucked the hair from his face. They hated him. They ridiculed him. Everything you can imagine. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. At the same time he was saying that, the rest of this verse was saying this, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. That's the rest of the verse. While he, was, while he said that, at the very moment he was saying, and they. That's what they were doing while he was saying that. That's amazing to me. Jesus is hanging down on the cross for the sins of these people. And he said, Father, forgive them. And they still cast in lots for his garments and ridiculing him. If we had been there, we might have been one of those very ones mocking him. Amen. You might have been one laughing and joy, joyfully joking while the Son of Man was giving his life on the cross to save a wretch like you or me. Christ did not ask us to to do anything he hadn't done himself. He would not he had not done himself. We ought to also give ourselves and our Amen. desires mm. to be used of God. We should do all we're able to do <coughs> cheerfully, <coughs> gladly, for the glory of God. Showing kindness, gentleness toward others, being merciful and forgiving. I love that word. Kindness. The word kind. You know, you can say a lot of things about a person, but something says a lot about him when you said he's kind. Isn't that a wonderful thing to say about somebody? Mm. They're kind. They're gentle. Gentle. Easy to be entreated. What blessed words to be said about a person. I want those things to be said about me. If you're a real believer, you want to be known as someone who's gentle, <coughs> kind, merciful, forgiven. Ephesians 4, 31, 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you and all with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, <coughs> tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Oh, what a world this would be if we could teach this to the world. <clears throat> well, you command to do just that. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever. He's taught us. Whatsoever he's taught us. And I just read what it says. Be ye kind hearted, tender hearted, kind, tender hearted, forgiving one another. As, and even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So we ought to teach those things. Everyone listen to us. I pray somehow, some way tonight, I've shown you somewhat of the way God's people ought to live. I also pray that I've showed you the way God's people do live. Do live. So may God bless you. Mm.
holy ground. 